I was born in China, near Harbin, that's northeast China. They call it Dongbei, northeast China. I was born there into a family, that's my grandparents' family, who had uh, immigrated from South Korea all the way to China. And uh, that was right in the middle of Japanese occupation. My parents, grandparents wanted to avoid the Japanese rule and migrated into China only to see the Japanese influence extended there. So Japanese experience, I personally, uh, all the uh, atrocities and uh, uh, unkind kind of policies by the Japanese occupants. But that was uh, the beginning of my life. You know, I'm near 80 years old. If I see around the world, pick a person of 80 year old from any country, I can bet my experience has been more diverse, more painful, more significant, more educational. So that's what, the reason I bring that out is not to talk about me. If you want to know a person, you have to know the life context in which the person uh, was brought up. That is important. Economic conditions, political conditions, cultural conditions, social conditions, all these political, international environment. The life context of that person is very important to know. Likewise, any group or organization, or in this case, any country, background should be investigated very carefully in order to examine the country's behavior, including policies. The reason I'm saying this is if we want to know about North Korea, South Korea, inter-Korea relations, we must know the historical context in which these systems existed. So I can very quickly think of five important uh, dramatic experiences that Korean people, North and South, have gone through. One is after following decades, actually generations, centuries of peaceful kingdoms, in Korea, we had the Japanese occupation for nearly 40 years. The, Jap the Japanese colonialism was very intensely exploitive and dehumanizing. I personally experienced that, an experience so important. It will make you wiser, more intelligent, more capable of dealing with difficulties experience is important. So here, the, uh, the Japanese experience is number one. <coughs> number two, after the Japanese occupation ended as a result of defeat on the part of Japan in the Second World War in 1945, we had uh, US-Soviet Union joint kind of uh, trusteeship for about three years. And then in 1948, governments were established both in North Korea and South Korea separately. So that was the beginning of division of the peninsula. The country, Korea, was divided, North Korea and South Korea. Soon after the division, within actually a few months, we had a military con 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 conflict or confrontation 
between the two halves of Korea. In the Korean War, that lasted in a full-scale war situation, lasted for three years, 1950 to 53. The atrocities during the Korean War, including American and South Korean militaries, annihilated innocent people by the millions, both in North and South Korea. So that kind of atrocity, not many others experienced. We have that. After the war, of course, the world was swirled into a period of Cold War. The Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States occupied halves of the peninsula of Korea. And what happened? During that long period of Cold War, 70 years of Cold War made it to two systems entirely different because Soviet communism American democracy were not only ideologically different, but everything else you can think of. They, they were not only uh, different, but the, the system characteristics is such that uh, the two countries were incompatible, cannot coexist together. So much so that during the Cold War decades uh, of co coexistence, the two countries developed mutual antagonism, mutual demonization. South Koreans demonized the North Korea, North Koreans demonized the South Korea. You see, enemy should be different from demons, devils. This is a Christian society. In Christianity, love your enemy. I thought that's a beautiful, very deceptive. Who would love the enemy? But enemies should be loved by Christian ethics. But uh, enemies can, can be un killed, can be destroyed if enemies are perceived as devils. So during the Cold War years, all enemies became evils so that enemies were destroyed, killed, left and right. That was the period that we experienced for 70 years. The two Koreas represented such incompatible systems. They were the forefront of Cold War enemies, mutual devils. In that situation, the two countries developed a very similar culture. The culture is mutual destruction, demonization. Demonization include, number one, fear as of was trust, fear of each other. Number two, distrust of each other. Number three, distraction destruction of, including killing of human beings. So that's the uh, politics we had uh, last 60, 70, 75 years on the Korean Peninsula. Now, some things are changing. End of Cold War, the Soviet Union disappeared and the United States became the only superpower in the world. And uh, American influence was so great that North South Korea have transformed significantly. They have become different. <coughs> North Korea now is not really socialist system. It's a paternalist socialism. That is family-like socialism where the head of the family 
who is no longer uh, living, Kim Il-sung, is still regarded in the center of authority and power. All the politics, political directives are coming from his old sayings. North Korean politics, therefore, is called politics, <coughs> politics of paternalism, parents kind of protecting the people. Quite confusion. Whereas South Korea is diametrically opposed to that. It's a capitalism, individualism, personal achievement with the private property. South Korean economy, on the average, has shown to the world a great deal of success, miraculous success. But distribution, pattern of distribution is something else. Great deal of discrepancy between the bourgeoisie people, the haves, and have-nots, the proletariat people. So when you have a, such a polarization of distribution of wealth, you will have, as Karl Marx anticipated, some class conflict. That's what we see in South Korea. A lot of problems with demonstrations and so on, expression of their free will as they should be allowed in democratic system. So South Korea exhibits entirely different kind of political culture, political activities, policy preferences, entirely different from those of North Korea. So we have two different worlds in this situation. Now the question is interaction. Interaction and possibly eventual re re reunification. People ask me and ask all over the world, can North Korea and South Korea be united? Is unification policy? I have my very strong opinion I'm going to share with you here. I feel great in front of a group of students like you. I have spent my life, I have lived my life looking at students uh, at University of Georgia and all over the world. Here, uh, I'm going to share my perspective of the prospect, prospect of Korean reunification. There are theoretically a few different ways that such separate systems as North and South Korea can be reunified. One, the obvious one, is by force. In fact, in history, majority of reunification or reintegration has been conducted through the means of military conquest. That is one possible, conceivable, but not probable, course of reunification. It's un, un improbable and unlikely and unacceptable because the two governments, North and South Korea's ability to destroy each other is way beyond the imagination. South Korea, with the help of America, can destroy North Korea very extensively. North Korea, with their weaponry, can kill each and every South Korean person many times over if they decided to do so. Reunification through military confrontation is unacceptable and unlikely. We cannot allow that. But still, if you look at South Korea especially, there are people and scholars who suggest that we should reunify and by destroying North Korea. I can tell you, South Korea, the United States included, cannot destroy North Korea because North Korea is not destroyable. For one thing, Physically, North Korea has all kinds of bomb shelters. 
Pyongyang, the capital city, has one subway system. That subway system consists of, in my personal calculation, 17 stations. The subway stations are under the ground, 100 meters on the average. 100 meters underground, straight go down. Elevator is kind of slanted elevator, will take you forever, long time. So people read books, magazines there on the way, but it's too long. But once you go down there, it's almost like a basketball or football field. That kind of stations all over, and all these stations are connected by you know, railroad. Railroad travels fairly large uh, space. So what I'm suggesting is all 2 million plus North Korean citizens of Pyongyang, the capital city, can hide in the subway station as bomb shelters. So they are 100 meters. Think about here, bus bunkers, you know, all the very strong uh, tunnel and bomb shelter break, breaking, penetrating. In my reading, 25 meters at most. Americans, uh, bombers can destroy tunnels of that depth, not 100 meters. So North Koreans will, not only Pyongyang, in other cities that I've traveled, they have bomb shelters of all kinds. They are very good at, uh, at digging tunnels, digging ground. So North Koreans will hide with the sirens all over the country. And American bombers and South Korean attackers will not know where to go. At the same time, South Korea, the city of Seoul, how many of you have traveled there? City of Seoul. It's like, a, it's open field. So North Koreans, they can throw a few bombs in South Korea, the city, where one-fourth of popula population of the country reside, will be demolished into a big fireball. So if, in fact, North and South Korea militarily are confronted, if you measure the success of military conflict by number of people sacrificed, then, in my mind, North Korea will come as a victim, will never be defeated. America should know, and America knows that. And South Korea can be very vulnerable. Of course, the U.S. has all kinds of uh, weapons to destroy North Korea. But it will take a longer time. People, people will slav, uh, starve to death as opposed to destroyed and killed by offensive weapons. So here, military confrontation will not lead to one side victory. Both will be destroyed completely. And therefore, neither side will opt to that with a rational mind. We, as an observer, we should never allow North Korea, South Korea, come to a military confrontation by themselves. Then what does the United States do? Not a whole lot. They don't need America to destroy North Korea. And uh, South Korean vulnerability will be there. 
So military conflict-based uh, unification is not possible, nor is it acceptable. That's number one. I get rid of that. You know, uh, it is. It is. There are some politicians, especially in the South, that North Korea must be destroyed. That's a desirable thinking, but it cannot be destroyed. We don't have any practical mechanism or physical capability to destroy and root out North Korean system from the face of the earth. It's impossible. Only South Korea will be more vulnerable. That's number one. Number two is uh, unification by absorption of one system into the other. Best example is uh, Germany. German division, East and West Germanys, got reunified as a result of East Germany was absorbed into the West. More affluent, more stronger, politically more diverse, certainly, and more people there. West German ability to absorb East Germany was there. And uh, even today, after decades of reunification of Germany, former Eastern Germans are still regarded as, treated as second-class citizens. They are very unhappy. German integration has not been satisfactorily achieved if you look back from today. North Korea doesn't want to be absorbed into South Korea. But now North Koreans are even saying that maybe South Korea can be absorbed into the North. That's what they're saying. Not many people have heard of that. But North Koreans are saying just that. They will never be destroyed. But South Korean, all kinds of distributive injustice, social, public opinion, cultural problems, make South Korea quite weakened and maybe absorbed into the stronghold of North Korea. Some North Koreans believe that, not too many outside North Korea. My view is that absorption cannot be, should not be allowed to be a unification mechanism. It will not. East Germany, was much weaker in comparison with the West Germany, if you compare that with the Korean possibilities. North Korea is not as weak as East Germany was. In terms of population, North Koreans a lot more than in terms of proportion of num percentage of number of people. North Korea is uh, half of the size of South Korea. But East Germany was uh, much smaller comparison than the difference between North and South Korea. Much smaller than West Germany. And East Germany was sustained for decades with the help of the Soviet Union by the strong presence and guidance of the Soviet Union. That was East Germany. But now, North Korea never allowed any country, including the Soviet Union, to come in and control the system. As you know, some of you may have heard the North Korea self-reliance doctrine. North Korea developed a much more subsistence, much more stable self-reliance doctrine. So for those who know Korean language, Juche Sasam, 
uh, to change self-reliance doctrine. And uh, uh, North Korea will not be absorbed into the South economically, ideologically, politically, there's no such a chance. Internationally, there was no Soviet Union, uh, comparable to Soviet Union in the German situation. We don't have anything. The United States only remaining superpower has not shown great deal of interest in, in Korean reunification. In other words, Korea is not likely to go through the process of absorption by the south of the north will not be possible. But still, in South Korea, officially, they think, certainly with the help of American blessing of the United States, saying that North Korea will collapse. North Korea is poor and people will rebel against the system, will collapse. We have expected North Korea to collapse in this way for 75 years. Nothing happened. You know, a country, you students should know this proposition, a country will not be abolished, collapsed, because of economic difficulties. Economic difficulties will make a people's life harder, but the regime stronger. All over the world, we observe that proposition to be valid, historically proven. Economic difficulties make the system stronger, be more penetrating into the lives of the people, Economic affluence, on the other hand, make a system more vulnerable, vulnerable to people's dissension, people's rebellion. North Korea will not have people's rebellion against the system because of economic difficulties. Country, any country will collapse if the country loses legitimacy to rule. Legitimacy comes from an ideology rather than economic condition. So South Koreans and Americans believe that North Korea will collapse if economic difficulties are sustained. It has not, it will not. So where do we stand? Unification, North Korea will not collapse because of economic difficulty. That the United Nations America would like to see. But North Korea is not like that. If you believe North Korea to be what you would like to see it to be, you're wrong. You have to know North Korea the way it is by putting yourselves in their shoes, living in the United States, your job is to study different systems and try to find ways in which they can live together in peace. That's what this uh, organization, this institution is all about, a very admirable desire and program. It takes real good knowledge of North Korea and of South Korea, existentially significant knowledge you know, North Korea, people ask me, how many times have you visited North Korea? I can easily say, maybe 50, 50 plus, 1990 through today, for about 27 years. I uh, visited North Korea more than 50 times. You know, why did I go there? To know North Korea, to study North Korea, to myself in their, in their shoe, put myself in their shoes so that I can empathize them better. Without empathy, you cannot learn 
a society or a person. So I tried to put myself in their shoes and see the world from their perspective, which is very important in order to explain and predict North Korean behavior, for that matter, South Korean behavior, American behavior too. So politicians say what they want to say. But we, as scholars and students of politics, should know what they mean. What they say may not be the same as what they mean. So we have to be able to read people's minds by listening to what they say. When North Koreans say, we will give up our nuclear weapons completely verifiably, irreversibly destroyed. That's what they have been saying. And Americans, especially this administration, and South Koreans, especially today's administration, they believe what they hear. Yes, North Korea will give up. But in my view, I know North Korea better than these two presidents. In my view, they will not give up their nuclear preparedness. Because they made nuclear bombs for good reason. For national survival, for national stability. That's what they needed. When Kim Il-sung, as a fighter, guerrilla fighter of independence in Manchuria, in China, where I was born. In fact, I was born, I spoke with many friends of my, uh, my, my friends of my father. My father was born in the same year as Kim Il-sung. So I knew they are mutual friends, and I interviewed them, and I wanted to know what kind of person was Kim Il-sung, North Korean first leader, is almost like a god today. And uh, I found out that uh, he was genuinely a guerrilla leader, a North Korean leader. He was not phony. He hated Japan. He had an ultimate military fear of Japan, because Japan was that powerful. And uh, he was shocked one morning, 1945, uh, uh, October sometime, when the emperor of Japan announced on radio, we surrender, unconditional surrender. Why? Japanese witnessed the might, the explosive capability of the atomic bomb. When the atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there were a lot of people, half a million people perished, and continuously future generations also affected. Even today, you go to Japan, you will see the remnants of physical remnants of uh, Japanese victim, victims of uh, the atomic bomb. So he thought, wow, if we get atomic bomb, no one will mess with us, Kim Il-sung thought. From that time on, he developed intense desire and followed his desire with policies to make nuclear weapons. He invited the Soviet, Soviet nuclear physicists to Pyongyang in residence. They were there for a long period of time. And he sent the North Korean physicists, nuclear physicists, to Moscow to study nuclear science for many decades. As a result, 
they were capable of developing nuclear technology, science and technology. Around the time when Kim Jong-il witnessed the demise of Saddam Hussein, Libya, Gaddafi, all these gave up their weapons, their nuclear weapons. The moment they did, they were on the way to their demise, their destruction, and their death. So Kim Il-sung watched all that. His son, Kim Jong-il, watched all that. So had an intense desire to complete their making of nuclear bombs, which they did. By 2006, when they tested their first nuclear bomb, there was Kim Jong-il, that is the father of this fat young man. Uh, he, uh, he witnessed that. And uh, in fact, uh, it was Kim Jong-il's era that North Korea accomplished uh, nuclear weapons making. Kim Jong-un, today's leader, is not designed to, intended to expand the military capability at all. Economic capability, that's what this guy is interested in. And they're right. They don't need to dwell on nuclear thing because in my view, North Korea is, currently, is a nuclear state. North Korea is a nuclear state and be recognized as such. You develop nuclear bombs, tested five, six times successfully, and tested your ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile technology, by shooting their missiles, their rockets, successfully, so many times, long range, medium range, short range, all kinds of weapons. North Korea is capable of delivering nuclear weapons, nuclear bombs of all sizes to different destinations in the world. They may make some mistakes, but they are capable of doing this. So my position is, as an expert, we have to recognize North Korea in terms of what it is, what it is capable of. That is, North Korea is a nuclear state. North Korea is not going to give that up. They made a nuclear state, and uh, North Korea is regarded an important player in world politics because of a nuclear bomb. They're not going to give that up, throw it away. So what does that mean? That means we have to work with North Korea with the inevitable ability to possess and use weapons, nuclear weapons. That's the situation today. So it goes back to reunification. What does that mean? Power balance between North and South Korea is not there anymore. If you take American troops, American military help from South Korea, South Korea is unable to defend itself. It doesn't have even the military capability of coordinating, commanding military decisions. America has that. Now they're talking about you know, how we deal with this uh, situation in South Korea. But uh, uh, so the, we, the unification through uh, uh, weapons and all this com competition will not work. And uh, nuclear weapons is a good thing for North Korea for its defense. 
but it not, it's not the answer to our complicated inter-Korea relations, North Korea, U.S. relations. So where do we go? We have to have, this is an important if you're students, we have been guided by what I call the security paradigm of the world. Long period of Cold War, what did they do? The Soviet Union, America, they accumulated weapons of all kinds, mass destruction included, nuclear bombs included. The two systems, superpowers of Cold War, they manufactured and stored up tens of thousands, not just a thousand, tens of thousands weapons. We're talking about two, three, five, twelve, but most weapons North Korea has produced. But we have so many weapons, and the world is, we really don't know where these bombs are. So the security competition, the competition who, who will have more weapons and so forth, will have no end. There will be more numbers, more people will produce more, more countries will join the nuclear club. North Korea may be the, may, may be the last one, it's not the end of the story. If we leave the world in the hands of security people, we're all losing. We must replace, replace the security paradigm with peace paradigm. If you're interested in a uh, short description of that, go to uh, Go to a TED Talk, T A D T A L K, TED Talk, and put my name there. You will see Peace Paradigm, the, the Declaration of Peace Paradigm by a scholar from Deep South. So here, uh, Peace Paradigm is based on not fear but mutual trust. Not destruction of demonization, but acceptance of differences. So, in the remainder, of, now it will take another hour, I'll have uh, uh, the peace paradigm that needs to be replaced, the security paradigm, if we are going to have a peaceful Korea and peaceful East Asia, Pacific region. The project that you are involved is so important. You know, we have to shift our global emphasis from Europe to Asia. The diversity in Asia in terms of ideology, economic accomplishments, in terms of cultural diversity, so all that should not be pushed into competitive mold, but rather mutually collaborating and mutually reinforcing, which is peace. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Once again, peace is not the absence of conflict. The absence of, of, the absence of conflict is just that, the absence of conflict. It has nothing to do with peace. Then what is peace? Peace, peace is accommodation of differences and creating harmony. Peace is harmony. You, some of you know Korean and or Chinese, right? Peace in Chinese called Hua Ping, right? In Korean called the Ping Hua. That's a peace. What is Ping? What is Pyeong? Plain, equal. 
not hierarchical. That's what plane is. Without peace, without this plane equality, there will be no peace. Once countries are rich, people are too rich, and creating all kinds of discrepancies and, uh, and a conf conflictual situation, there will be no peace. We have to promote equality of some sort. It doesn't have to be socialist equality, but distributive justice, distributive justice is so important uh, for, for peace.